Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. I'm uh, Denver Chief of Police uh, Ron Thomas uh, here with Major Crimes Division Commander Matt Clark to talk about uh, two critical incidents, provide a follow-up briefing on these two incidents. Uh, the first being a uh, in-custody death that occurred uh, a week ago this past Sunday um, with an individual that officers first contacted at 37th in Quebec. The second incident uh, being an officer-involved shooting that occurred uh, a week ago Monday uh, in the 800 block of South Quebec. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Commander Clark. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here and giving us an opportunity to provide an update on these two recent critical incidents uh, that were investigated by the Denver Police Department. Uh, the first incident, we'll just go in chronological order, uh, is the uh, in-custody death incident that the chief described in the 3700 block of North Quebec Street. It occurred on Sunday, the 26th of November, 2023, and officers were dispatched to that incident around 8.50 in the morning. These, both of these briefings are intended to be uh, follow-up based on information that we received uh, through the course of the investigation uh, by interviewing numerous witnesses, speaking to the involved officers, and analyzing evidence collected at the scene. So to the degree we're able to, uh, at the conclusion of each incident, I'll take questions. On Sunday, November 26, 2023, around 8.45 in the morning, Denver police officers were called to the Fusion Studios at 3737 North Quebec Street regarding an individual who was at the location in violation of a protection order. The uh, restraining order was related to a prior felony menacing case that had occurred at the same location in September of 2023, and the subject's movements were being monitored by GPS through pretrial services as a result of that case. The caller who was representing pretrial services reported that the, sub the subject's ankle monitor placed him uh, at the location which was prohibited under the terms of the protection order. Additionally, uh, the caller reported receiving a tamper alert indicating the subject may have removed the ankle monitoring device from his person. Uniformed Denver police officers arrived at the location around 9.20 a.m. and located the subject's ankle monitor in the alley. Officers determined the subject had uh, went into a unit at that same building there and attempted contact him, uh, with him at that location. At about 9.32 that same morning, the subject was located and arrested in the bathroom of that uh, specific unit. While officers were in the bathroom where the subject was arrested, they observed evidence uh, that he may have been attempting to dispose of narcotics by either flushing him down the toilet or running him down the sink drain in that bathroom. Out of an abundance of caution, the officers called for an ambulance to evaluate the subject at the scene in case he had consumed any narcotics uh, prior to the arrest. The subject was evaluated at the scene by a medical crew and determined to be medically clear for transport to the Denver Detention Center. The subject was transported from the scene in the back of a police vehicle. At approximately 1046, which was more than an hour after the arrest, the officer who was transporting the subject to the Denver Detention Center noticed the man was possibly experiencing a medical episode. At this time, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the officer at that point was in the area of 29th and Champa Street. That officer made notification, requested paramedics and additional officers responded to assist as well. Officers removed the subject from the patrol vehicle and attempted to speak with him to understand the cause and nature of the medical incident he was experiencing. At this time, the man was conscious and standing outside of the police vehicle. After several minutes, the subject became unconscious and stopped breathing. The officers recognized this, immediately began performing CPR and administered naloxone uh, in case he was experiencing an opioid-related overdose. The naloxone had no apparent effect on him. The subject was transported to the hospital by ambulance and was pronounced deceased later that same day. Based upon the custody status of the individual, uh, when he experienced the medical event, the department followed its critical incident investigative protocol, which included investigators from the Colorado Bureau of Investigations, the Colorado State Patrol, Denver Police's Homicide Unit, the Denver District Attorney's Office, and the monitoring of the, by the Office of the Independent Monitor. The subject was identified as 43-year-old Jesse Stowers. The Office of the Medical Examiner is investigating to determine the individual's cause and manner of death. And while toxicology details are not currently available, Preliminary information indicates narcotics may have been a factor in his death. The officers involved in the arrest and transport uh, and treatment of Mr. Stowers are patrol officers assigned to Patrol District 2. 
the officers had their body worn cameras activated and it captured their interaction with him both in the hotel bathroom or excuse me in the bathroom of the unit he was in uh, as well as when they uh, attempted to render aid to him the involved officers have returned to work in their normal patrol capacity i can answer any questions about that incident Uh, were there drugs found there? There was evidence of drugs. There was some paraphernalia. There was an indication uh, that he, he likely flushed um, a quantity of narcotics prior to the arrival of officers. When he was placed in the car, was he kept upright in the back seat? He was. He was seated upright and handcuffed behind his back. Did Sir? you guys encounter him? How long does it take for the guy to actually start showing signs of having a medical incident? It was during transport, so it was along the route in, from the 3700 block of Quebec to where the officer stopped near 29th and Champa. So several minutes of transport when they recognized he needed some assistance. Like about 20 minutes? Less than that, I believe. Yes, ma'am, sorry. Can you spell that last name? Is it S-T-O-W-E-R-S? That's exactly it, yes. S-T-O-W-E-R-S. Yes, ma'am. So this is the second in custody death then in November? Correct. What is your reaction to that? Well, this, again, I think uh, similar to the other is, is we're going to find a narcotics connection to those as well. Um, and it just happens to be that the officers are in contact um, at, with that individual at the time that they experienced that medical event. I think in both cases, the officers responded immediately, recognized it, uh, utilized the Narcan that they uh, carry with them daily to attempt to reverse uh, a potential opioid overdose. Do you guys believe that the guy was intoxicated? Uh, possibly under the influence of narcotics. Or, or I believe that possibly narcotics played, played a role in this to some degree. The toxicology, unfortunately, takes several weeks, so I don't have any specific details yet. You said this guy had an ankle monitor on. What's his history with drugs? Uh, so I'm not able to get into criminal histories on him. Okay. All right. The next incident is a police officer involved shooting that occurred on Monday, November 27th at approximately 1.40 in the afternoon. Uh, at the apartment complex located at 888 South Oneida Street. Uh, on November 27, 2023, at approximately 1.40 in the afternoon, uniformed Denver police officers were driving marked Denver police vehicles through the east side of the parking lot of 888 South Oneida Street. The officers were conducting extra patrol at the Cedar Run apartment complex, which is a large multifamily residential building at that location. The officers, while along the east side of the complex, observed a male in the northeast corner of the parking lot next to a pickup truck. They recognized it, or they observed specifically that the doors on the driver's side of the vehicle were open and the individual was moving boxes around outside of the vehicle. As an officer approached in his vehicle, he observed the subject had an unholstered handgun between his belt and pants on the back side of his waistband. The officer contacted the subject for unlawfully carrying a weapon as openly carrying a firearm in Denver is prohibited. The uniformed officers uh, that were there exited their vehicles, identified themselves as Denver police officers, and ordered the subject to keep his hands in the air and away from the firearm. The subject did not comply with these orders and became argumentative. Officers continued to direct the subject to put his hands on his head and, on his, and get up down on, to his knees, uh, which he refused to obey. Officers worked to de-escalate the situation uh, through ongoing communication efforts. One specific officer worked for just over four minutes to engage the subject in conversation in an effort to gain his compliance. While the officer was speaking to the subject, he abruptly reached to his back waistband area where the firearm was located. Two additional officers who were at the location observed this action and were specifically concerned if the subject would retrieve the firearm and shoot at the officers. In response, these two officers discharged their duty handguns at the subject, striking him. The subject fell to the ground and officers quickly approached. The officer secured the subject and recovered the firearm from his back waistband. They rendered aid until paramedics arrived and the ambulance crew transported the subject to the hospital for treatment. Through the investigation, it was learned that two uniformed Denver police officers discharged their weapons a total of five times. The firearm that was recovered from the subject was a Glock 17 9mm handgun 
The firearm was loaded with one round in the chamber and 16 rounds in the magazine. The magazine in the firearm had a capacity of 17 rounds. The subject has been identified as 32-year-old Zachary Yates. Mr. Yates was treated for two gunshot wounds and has since been released from the hospital. Mr. Yates was charged with unlawful carrying of a firearm for openly carrying a firearm in Denver. He was also charged with possessing a high capacity magazine that could hold more than 15 rounds, which is prohibited by ordinance. The officers who discharged their weapons are assigned to the patrol division in District 3. Both were wearing Denver police uniforms and driving marked police vehicles. One officer started with the department in 2017 and was involved in a police shooting in 2018. The other officer has been with the department since 2019 and has not been involved in a prior police shooting incident. Both officers, or all the officers that were at the scene, had their act, uh, body worn cameras activated and it captured their interaction with the individual throughout the uh, contact. The involved officers in this incident will be placed on a modified duty status as they complete the department's reintegration program. And as in the other uh, incident, we utilized our critical incident investigative protocol with our partner agencies. Anybody who had information about this case uh, who may have witnessed it that investigators haven't talked to, I would encourage to contact the Denver Police Department or Crime Stoppers uh, and provide additional information which would be helpful for us. I will uh, briefly uh, show some slides for this. So uh, here's some still shots from body camera that I'll show in case you either haven't seen the video or choose not to watch the video. Um, this is a screenshot of, from the contact officer as he was approaching. The black pickup truck is the subject's vehicle. The subject is outside of the vehicle at this point. Uh, and the officer at this, uh, from this perspective is looking directly at the back of the subject. And by doing so, it's difficult to see, but I'll call out specifically this area by his waistband. Uh, the handle of the firearm is up and the, the barrel and muzzle are pointing down to the ground. That is secured between his belt and uh, his pants. There's no holster or any other type of retention device holding that uh, firearm in place there. This is the view of one of the involved officers uh, who's uh, not having direct communication but is providing um, uh, assistance at that location. Uh, he has a specific view of the right side of the subject there. At this point, this frame, uh, the subject's arms are up. He would not keep them in the air, kept moving them around. Uh, in the next frame, three seconds later, the subject's hand has now moved behind his back uh, in a way that the officers believed uh, he was preparing and was attempting to grab the firearm from there. This is just uh, a, a couple frames prior to the firearms being discharged. Uh, as the officers approached, after the subject was struck, here's a screenshot of the way that the firearm was held in the back of the subject's waistband. Um, as you can see, again, unholstered and clearly visible, and that's what the officers reported seeing uh, as they approached. And the firearm that we recovered, again, is a 9mm Glock 17 uh, handgun. Any questions about this incident? So the officer that fired of the view that we're looking at, uh, the, the officer on the right side of the screen, the officer who was communicating with the subject is um, more positioned directly behind the subject's vehicle there. This one, the one on the far right of our screen, uh, were involved, and then the one across uh, directly behind is not involved. He was the one communicating with the subject. This is a, uh, it's an apartment complex, a multi large uh, apartment complex near uh, Leedsdale and Oneida. Okay. Two shots, or two shots? Uh, in the upper neck kind of area, uh, one shot, and then he had a graze wound to his arm. So is that, is that according to you guys' training? Because you feel threat, you just go and shoot at somebody, or how is the process? Sure, so the officers, uh, believe that he was attempting to retrieve that firearm. He had been non-compliant the four minutes prior where they attempted to uh, get his compliance, to get him to keep his hands in the air on his head away from that firearm. Um, he wouldn't get down on his knees. 
and then that coupled with uh, the specific movement as you watch the video you'll see the specific movement where that hand previously had not gone back behind the back the officers reported that was specifically concerning to them uh, feeling that he was attempting to retrieve that firearm and despite their orders and direction not to do so and that caused them to fear that he was going to take an action that would cause them harm did the guy have any criminal so we don't speak to criminal histories during these briefings. Yes, ma'am. About a minute into body worn camera one, you can hear the suspect say, I'm a suicidal disabled veteran, go ahead, kind of alluding to go ahead and shoot me. Continuing the question on training, is this in line with proper mental health training in terms of de-escalation or trying to provide some form of help to someone who could possibly be in mental distress? So I, I believe that their actions were in line with training. I mean, there was, I think, a significant attempt, four and a half minute attempt to de-escalate, to establish a rapport with him. I think you hear an officer asking about military service. So I think they're really trying to connect with him and get him to comply, get him to understand that they are not a threat to him. They just need him to safely comply with their directions. And then he all of a sudden makes that, that sudden movement that puts everybody, I think, at risk. Was a guy from Colorado? He, he did, yeah, he, he did, uh, he's been in Colorado for uh, a period of time. He wasn't new to the area. I'm not fully aware of the laws about firearms and things like that. Can you kind of explain a little bit why having a firearm is illegal mm -hmm. you have the Second Amendment to the Constitution? Certainly. So it, it wasn't the fact that he possessed the weapon. It was the fact that it was openly displayed um, like that. And so... Uh, that is that is illegal and that's the reason for I mean their attention was drawn to him for other reasons but once they saw that he had that firearm I think that it was uh, wise for them to make safe contact try to recover that firearm and then investigate further exactly what's going on yes ma'am we know he doesn't live there but initially you say that he has some connections with the debt department maybe correct is it clear now what he was doing there that day not uh, entirely clear uh, as we said he did have some association with a resident there and so I believe that that was his vehicle and I think what the, what was observed um, uh, prior to officers making contact is him you know throwing articles from the from the cab you know cab portion of his vehicle into the trash mm -hmm. can you say how long the officers who shot him will be on modified duty uh, unknown. I mean, I would I would say uh, at least uh, two or three months. And so there's a there's a specific protocol that we go through, uh, making sure that we address any uh, trauma that may come from from them being involved in a critical incident. Yes. In the body cam footage, um, the officer says that there is high gang activity in that area. Is there any connection that you might know of between them and gang and the integrity of the system? No, not at all. Any particular explanation why the guy wasn't shot in his arm or his leg at that time? Well, because that's honestly not part of our training. I mean, our, our training is certainly to to shoot center mass. That's you know I think the largest target. So you know the the most likely that we'll be able to to strike a person, incapacitate them, and and then you know be able to render the situation safe. He was struck five times? No. He was struck twice. twice. Five rounds were fired. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Yes, ma'am. How far away were those two officers that shot him? Um, they were approximately uh, 30 to 40 feet away from him at that point. And how many officers responded to this scene? So initially there was two present, a third arrived, and I think in the end there was five officers present. This subject's still alive. He has been released from the hospital. Yes, sir. Thank you. Did all the officers agree that he should have been shot the way they should have shot? Because the, the one officer is, is, he seems surprised. So, yeah, I, I can't speak to the officer's perceptions, certainly, but I think that, you know, obviously the, the one officer that you see here He's the one that's primarily engaged in the dialogue, and so his focus is on the individual, you know, trying to maintain eye contact and, and maintain a dialogue. 
whereas the other officers, I think, were um, looking at his hands, recognizing that his hands are the threat, him, him being able to access that weapon or a threat. And then when they see him, you know, after being told numerous times to put his hands on his head, and he's kind of, you know, got his hands here where they're visible, certainly not compliant, but certainly, you know, not in a dangerous uh, position. But then when he makes that very quick movement behind his back, I think it's a reasonable assumption that he's going to retrieve that weapon, and that is when the two officers that perceive that action and recognize that that is exactly where that gun is, that that's when they fire. He was taken into custody for display of firearm when the officer is prohibited. So what are the charges that he may face at that time? So he will be in jail, he will no. be fined. So specifically he's been charged with uh, the, the revised municipal code violations for unlawful carry of a firearm and prohibited uh, um, possession of a uh, high capacity magazine. The magazine he had had the ability to carry 17 rounds and the limit is 15. The magazine was in his truck or in his gun? That was in the gun that he had in his waistband. Has there been any mental health evaluation or anything like that? So it's not something we typically speak to in these uh, briefings. Yes, ma'am. Just kind of wrap it all up in a nice big bow. Your general reaction to how everything was handled here. You know, I I am pleased with the officer's actions. I think that they took a significant amount of time to de-escalate that situation. I don't believe that any officer uh, wanted to to fire in this particular case, um, and took uh, you know a lot of precautions to try to get this to end peacefully and. Uh, we certainly wish that that would have happened, and I think that's our um, communication to other people is, is uh, we know that we're going to encounter armed individuals in the future, and, you know, when that happens, we would uh, certainly prefer that they, um, that they follow the officer's directions and not make furtive or threatening motions uh, that cause us to take those kinds of actions. So, thank you. Yeah, good question. So, I mean, I, again, I think that the, 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 the best advice that I could provide is to follow the instructions that you're given. And if you feel as though your uh, rights have been violated, there are certainly avenues in order to pursue that. So, thank you.